tell you why. The same week that I got invited to church by this lost kid who wasn't even a church, I mean, who wasn't even a believer, but was a church kid, there were these people from this church, Shades Mountain Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, who were coming to my father's restaurant to eat. And while they were there eating, we're talking about the pastor and the worship pastor. But well, they didn't call him worship pastor, they called him the music director, all right? While these guys were eating my dad's restaurant, they'd seen how he was shorthanded on waist staff. And instead of complaining about the service, about the people in the restaurant, instead of complaining about bad service, you know what they did? These guys got up, rolled up their sleeves, and waited on tables at my dad's restaurant. And not only that, but they went back, the choir director guy went back, invited my dad to come with him to his church, to say, I need helpers, and then people in the choir spilled up like two sheets of volunteer sheets, and for a week and a half, almost two weeks, these people had been serving my father for free at his restaurant. And God, in his sovereignty, had used that to massage my dad's heart. So instead of saying no, when I asked him if I can go to church, you know what he yells across the room? What church? I didn't know what church my friend was inviting me to go to, but he did. He hears my dad, so he yells like through the house. Shades Mountain Baptist, sir. And it happens to be the same church as the people that have been helping him out. God's sovereignty at work. So my, friend, my, my, my dad yells, I know those people. You can go there, but only there. So Sunday morning, I get up, put on my chinos, go to this church. And as soon as I walk in, in the gym, I look across the room. And there are like 400 teenagers crammed in this gym. And like 300 of them are people I used to party with. So I thought, this is great. I mean, I walk up to my buddies, and some of them are standing there. These are people I used to party with. So I'm like, this is awesome, man. I thought church was going to be, like, really different people. And these are all people, like, you know, that I party with. And I sold wheat to you, and I went out with you. So I know you're not, you have no religion, you know. And so I'm just kind of talking to them. And every other word out of my mouth is a cuss word, except in church, they're acting really different. They're all walking around saying, bless you, bless you. Nobody's sneezing, you know. And, and so within five minutes, the youth pastor gets up and he goes, all right, everybody, we're running late, have a seat. So I go all by myself, and I sit in the front row. And as soon as I sat down, I looked up, and I saw Larry No. Let me tell you about Larry No. Larry No was half Korean, half English, and everyone in our town knew Larry No. Now, Larry No didn't go to my high school. I went to Vestavia Hills, but Larry No went to the school called Hoover High. And Hoover High was the number one high school in America at that time for football. You ever watch uh, Two A Days on MTV? That's Hoover High, all right? And so Larry Noe was this football player, half Korean, looked like a sumo wrestler, who kind of oompa loompa everywhere that he went, had no neck, and he, when he hits you, he hits you so hard, your spleen bled for a month. I mean, this dude was like a walking scholarship waiting to happen, all right, for any SEC team he wanted to play. But Larry Noe and I had met about a, about a year before that Sunday morning when I was at his church when he had walked up to me and some friends at a party, and he'd share the gospel with us. He wasn't a party he was invited to. He just showed up, and he walked over to us, and he said, Hey, guys, I was driving by. I saw these cars. thought I'd come in. God told me to come in. And, uh, hey, I want to meet you guys. And that's when I met him. About a year before that Sunday morning that I was sitting there at that church, and he was walking towards me, he'd walked up to me at a party, and he told me, he said, David, uh, guys, I want to tell you, I don't know what you're trying to fill your life up with, but only Jesus Christ can satisfy you. He's the bread of life. Only Jesus Christ can give you hope. It was like that beer bottle in your hand, all the stuff you're trying to do, all that stuff is not going to give you any hope. All that stuff's going to leave you empty. And he was like, Jesus Christ is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. That's John 14, 6. When he got done, he started to share. You know what I noticed? I looked over to my right, and I noticed that my girlfriend who was standing beside me was starting to nod her head like she was agreeing with him. And I didn't like that. You know why I didn't like that? Because I had plans for her. And the last thing I wanted was for her to begin to really listen to a guy who was calling her to be godly. Can I just, take, can I just throw this out to you for free? Some of y'all don't want somebody around you right now tonight to come to Christ because you have no intentions of being touchable by God. And the last thing you want is the person you're with right now to be touched by God because you have plans for them. You have an agenda for them. You're like, you know what I don't want? I don't want the person I'm with right now. I don't want my friends. I don't want my girlfriend. I don't want my boyfriend. I don't want these people to hang out with to get on fire for God. Because I got plans for them. I'd like for them to stay at their place of mediocrity, lukewarm living just like me. And I don't know what that's like. I had plans for her. The last thing I wanted her to do 
was to listen to this guy and get godly. The last thing I wanted to do was listen. And so I'm just kind of starting to make fun of him. Everything he would say, I'd make fun of it. And finally, he shook his head, discouraged, and he walked away. He got in his car and he drove away. And a year later, y'all, I'm sitting in his church, and he's walking right towards me. And I thought, now it's his turn. He stands over me, and he looks at me, and he goes, I remember you. That's exactly what I was afraid of. He goes, you're Larry. He goes, you're David Nasser. I'm like, yeah, you're Larry, right? He goes, yeah. He goes, man, I'm so glad you're here. You know what he says? He goes, this is an answer to prayer that you're here. He goes, can I sit beside you? I'm like, just don't sit on me, bro. Whatever he means, he sits down, and the youth pastor said something like, get your Bibles out. And I didn't have a Bible. I don't know that hotels you have to steal one from the Gideons. So I kind of felt left out. So I'm kind of looking around, and then I feel something on my lap. Larry had quietly opened up his Bible and placed it on my lap so I wouldn't feel left out. And the whole time the Sunday school lesson was happening, all I kept thinking about was, man, I was such a mean guy to him. I was such a jerk to him. Why is he nice to me? See, I didn't understand that someone could love you despite you because they love Jesus. And when the Sunday school lesson was over, Larry stood up and he said this. He goes, David, I'm just so glad you're here. He goes, man, I've been praying for you. He goes, man, you got to come back tonight. And I had nothing to do with it. I was full of pride. And so you know what I said? I said, man, I'm not coming back tonight. And he said, why not? I said, man, i got stuff to do. I had nothing to do with it. I was just full of pride. You know what's going to keep some of you tonight from really surrendering your life to Christ? Your pride. Your arrogant pride. I know what that's like. Because I used to be me. And I just said, man, i got stuff to do tonight. You know? And so you know what he said to me? He looked at me and he said, all right. Do you don't want to come tonight? To church, that's fine, because we'll see you tomorrow. And I had no idea what he meant. And they had this thing at their church called visitation. Lost people call it harassment. Because 17 teenagers showed up at my house on a Monday night. They were like, can we come in for a few minutes? And they lied, because three hours later, they're still at my house, man. And they brought tracks that opened up into a cross, and they brought their little base bracelets that had the beads that all stood for something. And they just came in, and they just started going right to the basic. You know, they went right to John 3, 16. God so loves you, David, that he gave his only son, Jesus. And if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you'll have eternal life. They started to explain to me the gospel, how God existed and I existed, but I was a sinner, and my sin separated me from God, and how Jesus was the only hope to remove that sin. How Jesus lived this perfect life, and then he died a sinner's death to pay the penalty for my sin. And then three days later, he was resurrected, and he conquered the grave, and that same resurrection power was available to me. And when they got done, and they were like, David, do you want to give your life to Jesus? I was like, guys, it's never going to happen. You know what they said on their way out that night? I said, all right, see you next week. And they weren't kidding. For the next eight weeks, every Monday night, we're like, hi. The Southern Baptists are coming. The Southern, we were the Iranians, but we were getting terrorized with the gospel. And can I tell you this? Every time their church doors opened for the next few weeks, I was at their church. You know why? Because number one, they would come to my house and drag me. And number two, I wanted to go. I acted like they were dragging me, but I really wanted to go. Because deep down inside, I knew there was something bigger than all my pride, something bigger than all the different reasons that I wanted to neglect. I mean, just deflect away anything that God had to say to me. One night I was sitting at the church and the preacher was preaching. And we're talking about an old school preacher. You know, I'm talking about like, not like cool, hip, you know, pastor with jeans on. I'm talking about like old school preacher with like a comb over, you know, like straight out of King James. And, you know, nothing but King James and nothing but comb over. And just, you know, just come on down. We're going to condemn you and the kids. You're going to find hair like a fish and sausage. You know, that might be your pastor. All right. You know, and, and I just 